Hello, and you're very welcome to episode 206 of the Game Pit Podcast. My name's Ronan, I'm your host for this episode, and this is a filling up the corners episode. So, if you've been listening for a while, you know that we've been fighting about the different names of the different episodes, and we're trying to get a way to discern between this sort of an episode, where we're going to talk, or in this case me, just quickly about games that maybe we haven't played half a dozen times, fewer than that, but we still have some thoughts about and want to share them with you, as opposed to our Picking Over the Bones episodes where we really go deep into a lot of games. So for this one, I'm going to call it Filling Up the Corners. You're going to steal the name, steal it from the best, and I'm going to go through half a dozen games I've been playing recently, and hopefully you'll enjoy this run-through. And the first game is... Wonderland's War, 2022, two to five players, two hours long. Designs Tim Eisner, Ben Eisner, Ian Moss, and from Druid City Games. It is a competitive area control game in which each of the players is going to vie for control of five areas within Wonderland, the Lewis Carroll setting. And each of the players is representing a special character from within the Wonderland setting. You're the Queen of Hearts or the Cheshire Cat or the Jabberwocky, whoever you might be. And you've got unique powers you begin the game with and more which you can unlock throughout the game. Like the Jabberwocky can poison areas and make people lose uh, their units when you go to battle over the areas. Alice herself can get into fights more often. She can get back her shields again and again to shield herself from madness and the Jabberwocky's poison. The Queen of Hearts can spread out her units throughout the land more easily. And when she arrives in the area, she could lop the heads of one unit of everyone else that's there. So they're driving towards some thematic stuff. The game itself is played over three rounds, which is split into two halves in which you draft cards and then you battle using what you've drafted and it's about building up a bag of chits and that's how the battles can be run if you play quacks of quedlinburg it's very similar to that when you get to the battle time but previous to that these three drafting rounds it's like you're at the the tea party and in effect you're just going around a circle and you take a card if you do a complete circle you have to take some madness whoever's got most madness at the end of this phase is gonna get more madness chips into their bag which when you draw them is going to kill your units and affect in the, your hp really is what they are units in battle but when you're looking at the cards you're looking for whether it's going to take you make you take more shards which are negative which tends to be the more powerful cards whether it's going to give you supporters in an area which are your most basic unit and in effect are one hp they're wonderlandian cards which can give you other units each of which are unique have got unique powers and will add to your battle strength or some special chits you can put in your bag which again are going to trigger off certain powers there are upgrades which you can use for yourself and unlock your special powers become more poisonous become better in battle whatever it may be there are quests you can take and quests are one of the ways in which you can score vps and they're always split in two and you get three points for having done something within the game a lot of them are to do with how you've built up your bag you get three points for having achieved a certain thing within the battle if you do both on the same card you score nine points and that could be a fair old whack of points in the game and also you can get these actual chits to put into your bag these allies after you've drafted three cards you then choose what area your leaders are going to go into now we're going to go around the five areas and if you're present in there everyone battles at the same time if you're not present the first thing that happens is you put a wager on and you secretly choose who of the factions who are present in the battle you think is going to win in order to get a bonus chit if you're right or more madness if you're wrong so it actually does make a difference and then everyone who's involved has to draw and when you draw out the chit, if it's a madness chit that is what hits you and takes away your units out of the battle if it's an ally it's going to add, somehow add to your power. And you're going to keep track of that on a battle track. And after you've drawn at least one chit, you've got a chance to retreat, which you may do because if you lose all your units in a battle, you're gone. You have zero battle strength. You can't get any rewards out of it. But again, these quests might want you to stop at certain times on certain powers or but yeah, if you've got like a one as your last thing that you've drawn. So there's various ways the quests will drive what's going on within the battle. Once everyone's out or there's only one person left or everyone's passed or wherever the battle's going to resolve if you get to a certain thing you win automatically whoever won is going to get a certain number of points that number of points tends to go up as the rounds go on and they also get to put a castle in that area which will add to their battle strength from now on and will score them a certain number of points at the end of the game 
the number of points which you can drive up by making choices during the game and you choose which powers to unlock to get more supporters, to get rid of madness, whatever it might be, every time you get to activate your own little board of things which you can do. Now, for Wonderland's War, the theme and the presentation, I've only got the retail edition, which doesn't cost too much, in my opinion. And it's for what it is, I know there are amazing versions out there with lovely chip stuff you can buy. I think the retail version is a very good product. What I find strange with Wonderland's War is, for a game with drafting and battling, the interaction was actually lacking. In the draft, there always seems to be decent options. When you get up to five player, there always seems to be very few options. And I wasn't that fussed by what cards everyone else took. I was never like, oh no, you took that one. I always felt like I could get something. So I wasn't too gutted. Within the battles themselves, it felt a bit bloodless. It was rare that people were drawing and it was very exciting. What have you got? What have you got? Part of that was because the drawing is very random. And you can get runs where you've got a bag and you think you've got a bag just as good as someone else, but you happen to draw out more madness chits. Now, no one had loads and loads of units in any one area because to us it didn't seem worth it. I guess you could like just pile all units into an area and make sure that you win that. But the amount of points that you're winning for an area, like in the first round it's two or four or six, whereas for quests you can get nine points. And not until the third round can you start equaling that by winning a battle, which feels like much, much harder work. And the fact that these quests are worth so many points means people are stopping at strange points within the game. You look at someone and go, well, you've got a really strong bag and you've got lots of units. You're, you're probably going to win this. And they just stop and go, no, I'm stopping here. Oh, I bet on you. And the whole thing felt like, I don't really know what's going to happen. I don't really know what everyone's motives are in this battle. And therefore, I'm not that engaged and when bad things happen to people, you can sympathise with them, but no one's really like, oh, yeah, no. It was a bit sort of, oh, yeah, there's a thing that happened. Let's go on to the next battle. So I think they did really well with the theme, but overall it felt a bit lukewarm. And I didn't think that players connected with the contest within the game. We were there, we were doing stuff, and things happened and we all went, okay, I'm not sure anyone could really tell you what the scores were at the end because I'm not sure anyone was that fast. We had a player with a very sort of incredible run of bad luck and yet made it up and wasn't dead last because they scored about 80% of their points just from quests. And when you can do that within a game, when the central mechanism isn't the central mechanism for scoring, if you've listened to me before, you know that that kind of puts me off. And the primary objective that I feel like we should be driving towards has been overwhelmed by other ways of winning. So Wonderland's War, I liked a lot of it. I didn't like parts of it. I didn't feel like it coalesced into something that was hot and exciting and we're having fun and, oh, you've poisoned me and I'll get back at you. It was like, oh, that happened. Yeah, cool. Oh, that happened. Cool. Oh, you won this one. Oh, great. Decent. I won't be suggesting it because in the end, everything you do feels a little bit inconsequential. So that was Wonderland's War. Now, when Clank came out, it made a bit of a splash. It is a competitive deck building dungeon crawling game and it was something a little bit different and people like games generally that do something with deck building and Clank certainly did that. It's had various iterations, including a legacy game. And last year, in 2022, Clank Catacombs came out. Two to four players, about 90 minutes, designed by Paul Den, as they all have been, and from Dire Wolf. In Clank itself, any of the Clank games, you're going to build a deck of cards and you're going to generate resources by playing those cards on your turn. And the resources you generate are going to let you buy cards, collect gold, which will count as points, or to let you buy equipment when you get to market rooms in the dungeon to have swords which allow you to move through certain types of dangerous tunnels without taking damage. We all have a set amount of health. If you take damage equal to your health, you are out of the game unless certain circumstances we're going to come back to. Or to fight monsters. There's always a monster available, but there are monsters that appear within this market row, this dungeon row of six cards. And by fighting them, spending your swords, you can get rewards and make the whole dungeon a bit safer for everyone. Or you have feet that we will use to move through tunnels to go from room to room to room. Now, in the original Clank, 
that was around the board. So you can see where all the rooms were. There were a few surprise and tokens you flip over, but you could see where the rooms were. Clank Catacombs' unique selling point on the Clank system is that this is done via tiles, and every time you play a dungeon is going to be different, and it's modular. And when you choose to walk off the edge of a tile to an empty space, you draw, and then you place it, and you can tessellate however you wish to put it and rotate that tile. And that pushes on whether you're going to be interested in Clank Catacombs or not. That twist off the game. In the market row, as cards come out, there's going to be ongoing powers, there's going to be acquire powers as you get them, there's going to be arrive effects, but also when some of them arrive, they trigger a dragon attack, because as you're doing stuff with your cards, you can generate something called clank. And clank is basically your cubes go into a pile when the dragon attacks, you scoop them up and the ones that are in the pile, they go in a bag with a load of these neutral dragon cubes, and you draw them out, and if your colour is drawn out, you're going to start losing health, and it's relatively hard to heal within the game, and this is the driving and the mechanism that pushes you through having to run into the dungeon and get back out again, because if you lose all your health before you found an artefact, and in Clank Catacombs you don't know where the artefacts are, you've just got to run in and try and find them, and back to the relative safety, so you're not in the depths, and it's just the first four tiles that you draw are safe. If you can't get back to them with an artifact before you're knocked out, you've got zero points. And I found that within this one, with the modular system, it's very hard. There's a lot of one-way tunnels. There's a lot of crystal caves that seem to be very well designed to stop you from getting around the place quickly. And on the initial start tile, there's a lot of one-wayers that say, yeah, you can get out of here, you can get into the depths, but good luck getting your way back. And as the game accelerates, as people find more artifacts and more treasures that drives up the dragon's rage, more and more cubes are going to be coming out of the bag. It's also got something that wasn't in Clank, and that's haunted cubes, ghost cubes. They can come out from a couple of mechanisms, but some of the tiles are haunted. I think that's from the legacy. And when a ghost cube comes out of the bag, everyone gets hit. So no matter how careful you're being, there's still a timer on how quickly you have to get your artifact and get back out again. With Clank itself, I played it a bit when it came out, I played some of the newer maps and it got a bit samey and obviously Catacombs has tried to do this. I also think that the deck is slightly cleverer than the original Clank deck. Now you can play with the original Clank cards or from any of the expansions or you can play with this deck. I felt there was a few more synergies within there. There's always been ways to not make Clank entirely negative because it's very difficult to play with all that Clank. There are ways in this, there are bards and stuff and cards that get better as long as you generate a certain amount of clank. And that's great. The one thing you have to do, though, is you must also concentrate and get some way to heal if you're doing that because you are going to get hit by the dragon attacks. And it does feel like the game is pushing you on. And there's a nice pace to it. And it does feel to me like the pacing is right. That if you choose to go deep into the dungeon, the more you move around... And more stuff you do, the more points you're likely to score. Playing very safe will mean that you won't score as many points because there's lots of things to discover. There's a new mechanism called lock picks. You need lock picks to go through certain locked tunnels. Once you've done it, though, that tunnel's open to everyone. But also when you go into rooms, you don't discover major secrets automatically. You have to spend a lock pick. There are prisoners in certain rooms. You spend a lock pick, you let them out. They give you bonuses. And there's various ways by why just going around, you're going to get more and more and more stuff and score more and more and more points. So whoever's gone the deepest and been able to get back is generally going to score most points. But it's the getting back that's the whole trick. There's stuff like portals you can zap between. They always seem to be in the wrong place. There are waypoints that generate you a bit of gold, but also there are cards that let you zip between waypoints. So if you could get a very clever way of zooming around quickly, but you really have to study the map in Clank Catacombs. There's also stuff like animated walls that comes out that makes every chart someone's standing on turn 180 degrees and that can mess with your plans as well and you're like oh all of a sudden i've got to find another way around because the one-way tunnels on this tile are now a different one-way tunnel i've enjoyed it a lot and if you've played clank you're going to know if you like this concept of clank moved up a bit it's an evolution not a revolution if you don't like the base system it's not going to change your mind if you thought i've played it a couple of times and i wish it was a bit different this is absolutely doing that for you it's not predictable it's an example of a design being refined and improved I found Clank Catacombs very enjoyable. I am definitely going to be putting it out and it's a keeper and it's now part of my collection. 
So there you go. Plant Catacombs a definite hit for me. The next game up is Archaos Society, a 2023 release. It's another reworking of a game, actually. Two to six players, 60 minutes long, designed by Paolo Mori and from Space Cowboys. And this is a reworking and a retheme of Ethnos, which takes the same card system, but changes up what you do with the cards. In Archaos Society, there are six expedition locations, and they have got increasingly difficult areas to get to you just move across it's like a track but you need more and more cards each time you want to move across the track and you're going to get varying rewards for how high up you are generally you're going to score more points for being further along at the end of each of the seasons if you're playing with a lower player count you have two seasons if you play with a higher player count you have three and more chance to score for being on these tracks within the whole game there are 12 different types of card which are linked to characters and the characters are like uh, they're all themed to sort of an archaeological expedition there are guides and there are physicians and there are photographers and there are all sorts of different things going on and there are six colors and the colors are linked directly to these six different areas on your turn you're either going to play cards or draft cards when you draft cards you take one card you take the card either from the market as what is available face up it starts with a few in but when cards are taken out of there they don't automatically refill we'll get to how it refills or you can just top deck if there are no cards available face up when you top deck you get two cards at some point there's a hand limit you're going to have to play cards down and you're going to want to because you play them in sets where either they're all the same type of card, same character, or they're all the same colour. You choose the colour if it's if it's several characters, or you choose the leader if it's the colour. And then you're going to maybe move up on that track if you've played enough cards of that colour. So if I'm on the red track, maybe now I need four cards to move on. And if I play a set of cards with red at the front of it, I can move across. However, I don't have to move. I will just play them down, and then I will do the special power off whoever I've chosen to lead that. So if I've done a set of pilots, for example, I have no choice, but it's the pilot's going to be a special power. But if I've got four red cards and they're four different characters, I can choose which of them is at the front. And I can choose to be the pilot or the physician or the botanist or whatever it may be. And they all do slightly different things. They can let you retain cards, move up on tracks for some of the ones you don't start with. You can maybe score a couple extra points if you're doing the botanist. There's various different simple things which they do. And one of the archaeological sites each game will also have a little special power you do as you move up it. The trick to the whole thing of our Chaos Society is that when you play cards, all the cards that left in your hand get put face up in the market. And you're creating opportunities for the other players in which they might be able to build up sets. Within this, there is sort of a lack of control in your drafting. You do end up top decking. I believe that for Ethnos, which was a bit of a hit at the time, it was really ugly. This is... It looks nicer. They've done it with no plastic components, which is very nice. All the player colours are very similar. They're brown and beige and stuff like that. I think it looks okay, though. Although the score track is a stupid circular spiral. It's a, it's a circular snake. So it's in a circle and it goes back on itself, which is just why are you doing that? And the score tokens don't fit very well on it. That's a minor thing, but there you go. Anyway, the complaint in Ethnos was you were doing area control and you were directly combating each other and you had little control on your cards. However... What they've done with this is say, okay, you don't like the direct conflict area control with this card system. We're going to give you something really, really dull to do. And I feel like they've they've got a very interesting idea with this drafting, an intriguing concept where everything I do may help everyone else. And they cannot find the right way of using it. With Ethnos, they were much closer than they are with our Chaos Society because going up these tracks is dull and everyone's moving at roughly the same rate and in fact if you can put together big sets of cards that's worth so much more points than just trying to eke out one two three extra points by moving up the tracks especially when you've only got two seasons to do it in that it's just i'm just playing these cards i may as well not have these tracks really kind of they needed to find something more interested to do with this system it's a misstep. It's a pointless reworking. It doesn't improve in Ethnos other than in the looks. I would play it again. But please, find something more interesting to do with it. Because this is just... It's a bit dull. There's nothing to really drag me back to our chaos society. The next game up is Sabika. A 2022 game, 1-4 players. 
Taking about two hours to play, German P. Milan and Ludanova. And the theme of Sabika is you are Nasrid nobles helping to construct Alhambra and also to build trade around the Mediterranean on both the European and Maghreb side. It's played over five rounds. You've got four workers who operate on three rondels. You've got two workers on the outer rondel, one in the middle and one on the inner. And they work independently to each other as rondels. It's just that they're all driving your actions. On the outer rondel, as you move your workers around, you're going to be getting building materials or you're going to be building. Now, you can build warehouses to drive and uh, create more storage for yourself or trigger a few powers. Or you can build major or minor buildings as part of the Alhambra, which will score VP for you according to which building materials you have ploughed into this particular project. They all require a start, and then the more you put in, the more points you'll score for doing it. There are what's called major buildings, which will move you up a track and get you some bits from the Sultan, but also often will allow you to take extra actions of the actions that I'm going to describe within the game. Upgrade your warehouses and sail and consolidate and bright poems. And this will all make sense to you or it won't in the next couple of minutes. You can also build minor buildings. They've got colours either side of them. And if you can combo them with your current row of minor buildings, you will trigger off and able to get resources or points or trigger an extra action. And this will all sound very familiar to you because every time you do something, it tends to be to get a few more resources or trigger an offer other action because actions are very precious because you've only got 20 in the whole game and you've got a lot to do and not enough stuff to do it with. Within the middle rondel, you're mostly going to be sailing or consolidating. When you sail, you're building out ships and you can build from city to city on a very small little map. And every time you arrive at a city, they want particular goods. Now, goods are available either from bonuses from things that you do or as you place around the rondel, depending upon where you go, you'll be able to pay a certain amount of money to get raw goods, which you'll need to refine. To pay money to refine these goods, there are a couple of actions you can take to refine these goods, rather than the building and the shipping and the consolidating. And also there are some building materials you can pay money to get, which will score you more points when you go and build the major and minor buildings I've just described. When you sail, there's certain goods that they want. When you get there, they'll give you a little bonus for creating the trade route. It will cost you money to get there. If you give them what they want, you will get extra points and extra what's called pariahs within the game. Another thing you can get as bonuses for building, expanding your warehouses, wherever it may be, because at the end of every round, you must pay pariahs or you will suffer a penalty. And the number you have to pay will go up as the game goes through. You can also, once you've sailed to a city, take this consolidate action. And when you do that, you're either going to get a one-off bonus action immediately, which there are ways to trigger again, or to get an ongoing income at the start of every round in money or pariahs or points or take a good or whatever it may be. Within the inner wheel, you're going to be moving your poet around. And they're mostly going to get you poems or get you money, or they might trigger some of the poems that you have already written into the walls of the Alhambra. Now, poems are always going to cost you some money, and they're going to cost you some goods. And again, the quality of goods you hand in, you're going to score more points for doing so. And they're going to have one-off, which you can trigger again via other actions or by get various bonuses. They're going to give you an ongoing, unique, special power to you. Generally, every time you do something in the game, you get something better. Or every time you do something, it might be a little bit cheaper for you. Or there are special poems. They're more expensive. You can build a maximum of two of these in the game. They're very varied. There's a big wide set of them. And we'll just have a certain set depending on the number of players. And they're going to score you end-game points for having done something in the game better than the other players. And if you are first, they'll score you a big wedge of 14 points. And then if you're second or third, they will score you fewer points. Generally, sometimes they'll just say, for all of this that you have, you will score a point at the end of the game. And those sort of end game scoring poems will very much drive which path you wish to go down in Sabika. Because like I said, there's lots of things you want to do, but you're not going to be able to do everything. And every choice you make in Sabika is a compromise which closes off other possibilities which you thought were open to you, but it turns out that they were not. Now we've talked about as you move around in a lot of places you can do these secondary actions because when you get goods they're raw, you cannot sail and trade with raw goods, you have to refine them which puts them into your warehouse, I mentioned you can expand your warehouse, there's kind of a concordia thing going on, you've got a limit in what you can store and it's very limited originally and you have to put both the building materials you collect 
which you're going to use every time you build or do a poem or add to the hammer in some way to score points, but also the trade goods, which is also going to be make you better at sailing and trading. They all go in the same area, and you have to have to pay some consideration to whether you just play with a very tight area or you wish to expand it, which will score you a few points every time you do it and trigger powers every time you do it, and will help you in small ways. And like I said, there are choices to be made all within quite a tight play space. Now, one of the major things I haven't mentioned is the rondel is very crowded. Two workers on each of the outside things, you're going to be bumping into each other all the time. And here's one one of the crucial systems that I've only touched on in Sabika comes in. Money. When you go to a space and there are other players, workers there, you can never go to one where you're, you're already there. And that's only valid for the outside world where you've got two workers. But you must pay one money for every worker that's there. You must pay money for your poems. You must pay money in order to sail. And making money is pretty difficult. So again, it's another way in which if I choose to do this and spend my money on that, my money's not available to do this, that and the other. And while I'd love to collect these endgame poems early on, or at least beat other people to them, by paying out that wedge of five or six money, whatever, four or five money, I am limiting what I can do on the board to get ahead of the other players. And maybe if I spend that money to get ahead of them on that, that will put them off buying that poem and I can buy it later on because the later you can buy them, the less you're going to need that money that you spent on them. But it's like that in in lots of different things. You're very much competing over the major buildings. There is a limited supply of them, especially the ones that trigger vital actions. And you can see if someone else is going for them, you're like, I need to get that before the other player. But... It's not that easy, and it is a race. One of the other interesting things is that the person with most pariahs doesn't just become start player, they choose who is start player. And when you start to get used to the game, you can analyse the board state and be like, I actually want you to go first because you're standing in all the spaces I want to go to. And if I can wait and get you to move on, that's saving me one money for every one of my actions. It's so tight, in fact, that instead of taking actions, you can take a worker back off the board, which costs you a point and gets you just three money. We played, most of the players, three of the four, had to do that at some point in the game. And the winner did that in the game. It's not like something, oh, it's a bust move. It is a bust. You've only got 20 actions, you're not taking an action. But the game is so tight that you might have to do that. And I love that. And you know I love tightness in the Euro, as long as it's got a clear path to what I'm doing. Combos are available where you might be able to do one thing, trigger this action, which gives me this bonus, and I get another thing. But they are hard-earned, and they are rare. And when you can do it, it feels like a big move. It's like, oh, okay, that took a lot of planning, and I pulled it off, and that was some good play. And quite often, when you're putting together a little chain of actions, you go, I'm one money short. I'm one building material short. I can do this, but only if that person moves out of there, which makes that one cheaper for me, or only if that person doesn't take that marble off the board. Because if I can go there, pay one and get it, it's available for me to do this, and then I can do that. And it's a lovely way in which every action that other players take reveals a little bit of where they might be going, and you're thinking about, okay, so they're going towards that. Can I beat them to it? Is it worth racing towards it? And as I keep mentioning, if I make that choice to race towards that and take that building before them, I am not taking these other paths available to me, opening up space for other players to move into. And every time you make something slightly easier for someone, well, then they're getting slightly ahead of this game of we're all vying, it's all very close. Who's going to get the edge at the end? Problems with it? The theme about building the Alhambra is very shallow. The building of the buildings does not feel like the most important part of the game. The poems do. Now, I know the poems are an integral part and they're written into the walls and what have you. I just didn't feel like I was helping to build Alhambra. Actually, trade was... Maybe it's because that's what trade looks like in games, you know. But spending a bit of money in order to establish these trade routes, which then would often give me bonuses or... There were, in our game anyway, in-game poems related to how well you traded. So that would score you points at the end if you'd done it well. And there was definitely vying for these things. I thought that was a slightly more thematic part of it. And I didn't really feel like I was building a hammer. But anyway, there you go. The other thing would be the presentation. Visually, it's quite busy. And I think that it's overwhelming to begin with. But... 
the symbology is good there's a very limited number of actions you can take so it is consistent throughout where every time you see a boat that means i i do the sail action and the sail action within itself is very simple the consolidate action within itself is very simple so if i see the shaky handies i'm going to move one of my ships across two centimeters to the right and get the thing which is either a one-off or an ongoing power and once you learn that which doesn't take long the symbology all works the thing that I would say is very difficult is that the poems are mostly very wordy. They are written in a thematic font, which doesn't necessarily mean it's the easiest thing to read, especially as was mentioned to me, very insightful, Alex, was a textured background. Uh, and you're like, uh, and you do often have to just go and pick all these poems up. Now, I thought it'd be a bigger problem, but in fact, money's so tight, you don't build loads and loads and loads of them. So you're not constantly referring to them. Wasn't as big of a concern as I hoped for, but there are certain things that in a game where every action is interconnected from other players and within your own plan, it is overwhelming to look at, but you'll get over it. So I, I can forgive that. I think Sabika is a very strong, tight Euro. I want to play it again soon. I'm certainly considering picking it up for myself. I'm gutted. It was for sale at UK Games Expo, and I didn't buy it because I hadn't played it yet, and I wasn't sure. I was a fool. I should have got it. Very good game. I enjoyed Sabika greatly. Well, Vagrant Song. Another 2022 game. Two to four players, 90 minutes long. Designed by Matt Carter, Justin Gibbs, Carl Rowan, and from Weird Games. How not to start someone off on your game. It's a co-op game about your vagrants and you're on a, a train and various hauntings happen. And you play throughout a sort of campaign system where you can slightly improve and get better equipment, get slightly better actions and stuff. But every game of itself is almost like a boss battler and you're playing on this checkerboard board, arena, <laughs> and there is one or a couple of ghosts they have their own powers and you're trying to bring down, trying to restore their humanity by taking actions. Physically, each of the pieces is standees and I think that they look very cool. I think it's got its own style of artwork, which is kind of like 20s animation, 30s animation, but you can't say 20s anymore, can you? 1920s animation. <laughs> it's not a modern feel. All of these bits of plastic come double-sided with plastic sheeters on, which you have to peel off to start with, which takes over an hour. I don't know, it's just completely unnecessary. And like, why are you making me spend an hour just peeling plastic off before I even start learning this game? So, all right, you're a little bit frustrated. You're an hour in, you've peeled some plastic off some things. <sighs> Annoying. Then you start trying to read the rule book, and it is awful. It is poorly structured, it is poorly worded, it is unclear, it is poorly self referential. And I stepped out there going, I don't know how to play this game. I read the rule book four times and still had to watch videos. And still, when playing, I had to go on Board Game Geek in order to clear up some stuff in what is mechanically and decision making a very simple game. But it does have lots of situations. And when you play, you go into a scenario book. And within the scenario, certain things happen. There's moments within games. And you look up the moment. Now, firstly, the scenario-specific rules are often incredibly confusing, but because the basic framework of a simple structure has not been presented in the rule book. When you've got a rule book, which is the base rules, and you've got a scenario book, which is this is what changes all the rules, or this is situation-specific, or when the ghost is in this state, these are the rules, when it's in that state, these are the rules, which is most of the haunts, that framework must be crystal clear because you're changing it and adding it when that framework is muddy and loose and is not clarified then the changes become ambiguous and can mean three or four different things and that's what happens in vagrant song and you just get so frustrated but the biggest problem on top of all of that is that what i'm doing is boring my powers are very limited as these humans trying to get humanity back and whatever it comes down to Often it is move or add one or two humanity to the ghost up to a certain limit. And you have to roll dice often to work out how many you're going to add. But you're using chits to do actions to do this, right? There are chits that can do special powers and you have to use them sometimes to do humanity. But what you do is you work up to a certain thing. 
and then the ghost resets and something may or may not happen and then you have to work back up to it again and then it resets and then you have to work out that sometimes you're doing it like four times you might be trying to get 60 humanity back and you're getting back one or two or three each time and then the ghost gets to do lots of fun things and they might switch around and knock you all the way to the other side of the map which you'll slowly have to walk back to get to them and then they might switch things around and they'll be at the other end of the map and you're like oh I guess I'll walk back towards you again, <laughs> shall I? Like, I just got a work doing, just walking and walking. You you can't often do the same action twice in a row. So, like, you're like, oh, well, my good action, I can't do it. And then it's the wrong time, so I can't do my good action now because you've changed the whole game state. Like, the second ghost envelops you. So then you're more or less sort of blind drawing out of a bag just to get the right chit to get rid of this thing that is ruining your game and every time we played at least one player was like I did nothing that's I just sort of stood here and then it appeared next to me and hit me and I hit it back for two and then it disappeared again and I was like oh what am I doing and there's so many frustrating poor mechanisms that they've gone for yeah but this is great story wise is it if I don't understand the story and quite often it was only quite late into a scenario that you start going oh, I kind of get why that power does that I get what this ghost does but I'm not having fun or you're not having fun or someone at this table is having a terrible game the ones who are involved a bit more are just chipping 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 away which doesn't add much to me all I feel like I'm achieving is a change of game state often which means the rules change a bit which means we all go oh now what does this mean back on BGG just to clarify because I'm not entirely sure because I feel so unsure of myself within this rule set that every time I tell you this is how something works I don't believe myself and it's a mess of a production it's a complete mess of a rule set they've pushed to be very ambitious but kept the base framework of the game so dull that despite all the things going on around it and there are interesting things and the haunts are thematic when you eventually get it and they are doing crazy stuff but the haunts are having fun and I'm not Vagrant Song is a poor game it doesn't tick any of my boxes I was very hopeful, I love a cooperative game I love a story game, I love a narrative game this was too much of a mess, all the frills all of that stuff I guess was okay the core of it was an absolute disaster So I don't want everyone to play Vagrant Song again. Definitely not for me. My last game is First and Roll, a 2018 game for two to four players taking 45 minutes. Stephen Glenn from R&R Games. This is a dice game that simulates American football. You play the game with a game clock. You can play over two halves. You kick off each half. You decide whether to return it or not. The other player does. And there's a die roll. So we play two players. You can play four players. We take charge of offense and defense each. I'm not sure that that would add much to it. Once you have the ball, you're going to choose one of three dice secretly. You're going to choose whether to run. Now that has lower numbers, meaning generally you're going to make less yardage. Because you're playing within downs, you're going to try and go with it 10 yards before you spend up all four of your downs to reset the downs. If you don't understand American football, you're playing by the rules of American football. This means nothing to you. If you do understand the rules, you're playing by the rules of American football. You have four downs to get 10 yards. If you do it, you reset your downs. Ultimately, you're trying to get the ball across the line to go a touchdown. If you feel like you're not going to do that, but you're within range, you might choose to do a field goal. The nearer you are, the more likely you are to succeed. There's a die roll, but the die rolls are not completely random. They are mitigated. And like I say, the nearer you are, the field goal, the more likely you are to score. But coming back to the main mechanism, when you choose to run, lower numbers on the dice, fewer yards this down, but a decent chance of making a breakout and trying to roll again and again. As long as your opposition, the defensive player, when they're choosing, hasn't chosen also the red dice. Because if they've chosen the same colour as you, they'll roll theirs as well. And you will add the two together and theirs will have minus numbers on. So you may get a yard or two or you may get knocked backwards and suddenly you're second and 12 and the whole situation changes. Or maybe you're second and six and you're like, oh, maybe my run game's working. But he'll think my run game's working. So maybe I'll go for the safer, shorter pass option. So I'll choose my yellow die, which has got slightly higher numbers than the run option. It can go over 10 yards sometimes and hasn't got too much of a risk of it going wrong or of it breaking out. Because when you break out, you can roll again and again and again, just add the numbers, add the numbers, add the numbers. But as a defensive player, I'm going, ah, his best option here is probably to take a safe short pass. But he's still got three downs left, so maybe he'll choose to run again and try and get up to within a yard or two. But if he does that, he will obviously run again. But will he obviously run again? Because I think he'll run again. 
And if I choose right, I might knock it backwards. So now he'll go for the short pass. Or maybe he'll go wild to go for the long pass, which has got the highest numbers on the dice, but also the, got breakouts. You can just go again and again and again if you go for an undefended long pass. However, also the defensive green dice has got the highest negative numbers on. So you might end up in effect getting sacked and losing a bunch of yardage if I choose right and guess that you're going for a long pass. And it is this psychological game of what are you doing in this, on this downs, in this field position, with this amount of time left, you can take timeouts to manage the clock. Everyone's got three for a half. You get the idea if you know the game. Uh, what are you going to... No. Like, you know, you're third and 14. There's no way you're just going to run. But maybe you just want it to be secure and you're going to take the punt. But maybe you're a nutter and you're going to go for that long pass. If I don't defend the run, though, you've got a decent chance of breaking out. And you, if you break out again then, then you might be getting to... Oh, what? And it's all that. It's all looking at each other and going, what are you going to do? Now, I played it with Lloyd, who knows a lot about American football. I know a little bit about American football, enough to be able to think, this simulates American football. I have done some sports coaching in my life, and I never thought I'd say a very simple dice game would replicate some of that feeling of, what are you going to do? What should we be doing? Obviously distilled into a smaller rolling dice game. (laughs) I absolutely love that you get the idea, but I am the target audience I was playing with a good friend who I was able to just abuse and quote any given Sunday endlessly at and we could swear at each other and I was jumping up and down and I was pointing my finger and I was like, unbelievable. The one bad thing about it is that turnovers are pretty random. He's going to be laughing when he hears this because I got smashed by turnovers. I absolutely got destroyed by turnovers. There's no way he should have won that game, man. He got out coached and out fought, and he came away with a victory, and I'm very, very bitter about it. But I had a ton of fun playing first and roll. I don't know, especially with our listeners. Actually, our biggest listener group is in America. If you like American football, first and roll is definitely worth giving it a go. There's loads of NFL fans in the UK. Any interest at all. But in terms of a game itself, it is a psychological game. I think you might need a bit of understanding about how American football works to really get into why you would make certain decisions at certain times. I might be overplaying that, I don't know. And while we're talking about where our listeners come from, we got a big, huge surge in listeners from Austria in the last month. So if you're from Austria and you just start listening to us, hello... Hi, I don't know, Pod B might be fooling me. Anyway, there you go. First of all, I liked it a lot. Very much looking forward to playing it again. I think it was a very good, simple simulation of a very, very interesting sport. And that's us. That's the six games I wanted to chat to you about. Thank you very much for joining me this time around. It is holiday time. Sean's currently in Wales. I'm off to Mayo in Ireland very shortly. We are going to get you that episode off the ones that we've missed out on in the last 10 years when I'm not entirely sure. But it is coming your way. And we will catch you again soon on the Game Pit Podcast. We are proud members of the Dice Tower Network. Head to dicetower.com for fantastic gaming content. Check out the Dice Tower Network for other fantastic gaming podcasts. If you want to get a hold of us, the Game Pit Podcast at gmail.com or go and jump on our guild and tell me your opinions on the games I've just been chatting about or any ideas you might have for maybe episodes we could do together. Maybe top 10s. Our top 10s always get the most listeners. If you want a top 10 or something, let us know. We think like doing drafts of games, just blatantly stealing the idea from like Board Game Barrage and uh, Punchball Paradise. They do them and I really enjoy them, so we might start doing some drafts. Sorry, guys. And other than that, I'll catch you next time. Our music is by E. Aaron.